Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the First Thursday Club um, for um, June, July, sorry. Um, today we're going to be uh, hearing from Professor Des Delahaye, who is a director at um, RSK Biosensus. Um, he's going to be talking about wildlife disease and ecological consultancy. Um, just before some housekeeping notes, I'd just like to say that we've had some issues with Desi's internet connection uh, this morning. So fingers crossed everything seems to be running okay at the moment, but just to give you a bit of pre-warning. Um, for those of you who have been to the first Thursday Club before, you'll, you'll be familiar with this, but for those of you who haven't, um, all the microphones are, are gonna be muted, so you can't interrupt or heckle. Um, but we are, we do wanna hear from you, we wanna hear questions. And what we'll do is use your, we can use your question dialogue that you've got. Uh, with the go to meeting um, and we'll corral all those and have a Q&A session uh, at the end of the presentation. So please add the questions as Des is talking as we go through and I can then sort of sort out the ones we'll ask at the end. Um, after the presentation we will be sending you via email a questionnaire um, so we would appreciate if you could take the time to, to fill that in. Um, it helps us refine what, what we're doing with, with the First Thursday Club um, series. Uh, but without further ado, I'll hand over now to uh, Des Delahaye. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, so, uh, hello everyone, and thanks for tuning in today. I'm going to talk about uh, wildlife diseases, why, uh, why they're important, how they can impact on the health of humans, wildlife and domestic animals, and how their emergence is linked to the loss of biodiversity. And uh, I'll also finish off by talking a little bit about um, why we should be concerned about wildlife diseases as uh, ecology professionals. But first, uh, just a, a brief introduction. So uh, as Tim said, I'm Des Delahaye. I'm an ecological consultant, have been for over 15 years, during which time I've managed ecology input to a, a range of different projects. I've also more recently started giving biodiversity advice to corporate clients um, and I, uh, I am developing research themes across the RSK biosensors companies. But I've also been a research scientist for over 25 years and I have a particular interest in the ecology of wildlife diseases. I've published on, uh, on many diseases of wildlife and also on the risks of the spread of these diseases to humans and to uh, livestock populations. And I've got a particular interest in the management of disease uh, in wild animals. So let's, uh, let's start at the beginning. Uh, what are wildlife diseases? So essentially a disease is some kind of departure from normal health. And we're going to talk today about infectious diseases and they're caused by parasites, also known as pathogens. And they come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. There are viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoans, which are single-celled organisms, and uh, um, uh, helminth worms, parasitic worms. So these can be uh, transmitted either directly. So for example, um, a virus might be uh, transmitted from one host to another uh, as a, as a, in a droplet. Uh, during coughing, for example, and inhaled, uh, or it could be uh, transmitted indirectly by contact with a surface that's been contaminated by the pathogen. And the other means of uh, transmission is through vectors. So you can see here uh, an image of a mosquito. This is the mosquito that spreads West Nile virus, uh, and several other arthropods are also responsible for spreading uh, bacterial and viral infections. There are between 5 and 30 million species uh, of parasites uh, in the world that we know of. And that means that over 50% of species known to humankind are parasitic. And so given their ubiquity, it's really no wonder that they have shaped evolution. And you can see here a picture of a, of a peacock with its very showy, elaborate plumage. And what that plumage is doing is it's signalling to any prospective mate that this animal is so healthy, so parasite free, that it can spend its valuable resources uh, on developing uh, this elaborate plumage. And of course, 
parasites and diseases are components of natural ecosystems. So why are wildlife diseases important? Well, the first reason is because some of those diseases, those that are known to be zoonotic, can be transmitted between animals and humans, and some of them can have quite a devastating impact on human health. They're also important to agriculture because some diseases can be spread from wildlife to domestic animals and back to wildlife. And the circulation of disease in wildlife can be of concern for conservation of endangered species, and we'll hear a bit more about some of those examples in a moment. But let's start uh, with a disease that everybody will have heard of, and no doubt everybody will know that it has a wildlife dimension, and that's rabies. So rabies is a zoonotic viral infection. It's one of the oldest recorded diseases. And it's swept across Europe in foxes from the Polish border after about 1939. But since the 1970s, we've had a large scale vaccination program going on to vaccinate wild foxes with baits, which have been largely deployed from the air. Uh, and that has been very, very successful. So now rabies is largely confined to Eastern Europe with only sporadic outbreaks in the West. Now, although the UK is officially rabies free, we do occasionally pick up a rabies case in an imported animal. And also very closely related Lyssa viruses are occasionally found in UK bats. So that's a disease that we've all heard about uh, and that we all know has a wildlife dimension. But there are some other familiar diseases that uh, it may not be so obvious that they have a wildlife dimension. So HIV, for example, human immunodeficiency virus, which causes AIDS, evolved from the simian immunodeficiency virus, which was circulating in wild primates. Uh, spillover from primates to humans probably occurred in West Africa in the 1940s, 1950s, and then as population size increased and urbanization increased in West Africa and gradually the, uh, the virus was able to take hold in the human population there and then spread further afield and of course it gave rise to a global pandemic. And then there's Ebola, I'm sure you will have heard about Ebola uh, in West Africa uh, in uh, news headlines in, in recent years. Now that virus circulates naturally in bats uh, in West Africa, but can also spill over into uh, great apes, so chimpanzees and gorillas, uh, and into small antelope called bukas. Uh, and from these species, it can then spread into humans, uh, usually through uh, eating contaminated bushmeat. And so uh, Ebola outbreaks uh, appear periodically in the human population in West Africa, and they do have the potential to be transmitted further afield. And then there's SARS, which was a virus that emerged from China in 2002. It's a coronavirus. It circulates also in bats, naturally in the wild. The bats seem unaffected by its presence. Uh, it also can infect uh, a variety of other animals, including palm civets. And it appears that human infection occurred as a result of uh, transmission uh, from eating palm civets. This is a very interesting example because uh, the uh, virus that's currently causing the COVID-19 pandemic, SARS-CoV-2, is closely related to the original SARS virus and also is likely to have originally circulated in bats and uh, infection is likely to have spilt over to humans again from wildlife and possibly similar to SARS as a result of wildlife being traded uh, in live markets. So what about the impacts of wildlife diseases on, on agriculture? Well, here's another disease that we've all heard of. Uh, it's been in the headlines an awful lot in this country, bovine tuberculosis. And this circulates between cattle and badgers. Infection goes in, in both directions. So cows can give uh, the disease to badgers and badgers can give it back to cows. The bacteria causes a chronic long-term disease in badgers. And so this means that badgers that are infected and are excreting bacteria into the environment can live for many years. And that makes them a very effective maintenance host 
and a source of continual potential uh, infection for cattle. Of course, it's a very high profile disease. It's very costly to control, costs the taxpayer an enormous amount of money for control in both wildlife and in cattle, and it's highly controversial. Then there's uh, African swine fever. You may have heard that there have been some outbreaks of this disease in Europe. It affects uh, domestic and wild swine. Uh, you can see a picture of a wild boar here. So a wild boar can, can maintain the infection uh, in the wild and then transmit it to domestic pigs. And in domestic pigs, it can have 100% mortality. And so these outbreaks in Europe have been something of a concern. We haven't seen it in the UK yet. If we did see it in the UK, then we would be facing similar kind of restrictions to movement around the countryside as we did during the foot and mouth epidemic, I would imagine. And then there's avian influenza, which is spread by migratory birds, but also causes periodic seasonal outbreaks in poultry. And of course, we've had outbreaks of this disease in the UK. And this is of particular interest to human health as well, because some strains of avian influenza uh, can be uh, 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 pathogenic in, in humans and can be transmitted amongst humans. And so before coronavirus came along, um, this was widely touted to be the likely source of the next global pandemic. So what about impacts on conservation? Probably one of the best examples of the impact that, uh, that diseases can have on wild animal populations is, is the uh, black-footed ferret uh, uh, experience, where th this uh, very rare carnivore had been reduced to about 130 animals in the wild uh, during the late 70s, early 80s, and that was reduced even further to only 18 animals um, through plague, and canine distemper. Since then, there's been an intensive breeding program, uh, uh, also vaccination of black-footed ferrets uh, and reintroductions into the wild. And the population is now doing far, far better. So I think we have in excess of a thousand animals in the wild now. And then as many of you will have heard of, uh, there is white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease in bats. This manifests itself usually with white spots on the face of the bat, hence the name, but also on the uh, on the wing membranes. And what this fungus does is it irritates uh, uh, the animal to such an extent that it's roused from hibernation. And of course, that has complications for the metabolism of the bats, uh, and they'll probably die of, of hypothermia. And so th this disease has been associated with mass mortality uh, of bats in roosts, in North America. It's spreading quite rapidly. Uh, it's a major concern for bat conservation over there. But interestingly, although we have the fungus um, in Europe and in the UK, the fungus has been detected in roosts and in bats, we don't observe white nose syndrome. We don't see the disease in bats and we certainly don't see uh, mass die-offs of, uh, of bats in roosts. And so this is probably because uh, bats in Europe have become uh, have evolved in the company of the fungus and have developed some kind of resistance to it, whereas bat populations in North America are naive to the, to the fungus, uh, and it was probably introduced from Europe uh, and then spread rapidly through this naive population. It's hoped that in North America bats will evolve resistance, but it's just a question of how much time we have before the impact on their populations is so devastating. And then there are the uh, amphibian diseases uh, that are of current global concern. There are two groups of pathogens that are particularly concerning, uh, ranaviruses and uh, chytrid funguses. And so uh, the ranaviruses, they appear to be a concern particularly in the UK for common frog populations. We've had some events of up to 80% mortality uh, in certain areas. Uh, amongst common frogs related to a ranavirus infection. So that's quite a concern. Uh, and chytrid, uh, one of the species of chytrid fungus is seen quite widely in the UK, although it's not been associated with 
uh, large die-offs of amphibians as it has been in other parts of the world. Uh, but another species of chytrid, there are two main species uh, that are of concern, but the other species that's not uh, apparent in the UK would be a grave concern for conservation of great crested newts if it were to emerge in the wild. Now we have biosecurity uh, precautions that we put in place while we're carrying out ecological fieldwork, uh, and they're really important in being a first line of defence against the spread of these diseases. So how do diseases impact on wildlife populations? Well, they can have very dramatic impacts, like sudden mass die-offs of animals. And one example of that uh, occurred in 2015 uh, in the critically endangered Saiga antelope populations of Kazakhstan, uh, where approximately 200,000 individual animals died as a result of uh, a disease called pasteurellosis. This is caused by the pastorella bacteria. Now, under normal circumstances, that bacteria wouldn't actually be uh, a problem for these antelope. Uh, it would be present in their guts and it would cause no problem at all. But because of uh, some rather unique weather conditions, very hot temperatures and uh, moist conditions, the bacteria were able to proliferate to such an extent that, uh, uh, that they, uh, they built up in such numbers that they die off released toxins into the bloodstream of the animals and they died in vast numbers. But uh, wildlife disease events don't always need to be quite so dramatic. Often diseases uh, cause chronic mortality in populations so they can reduce the survival of individual animals, uh, changing the age structure of a population, or they can reduce fecundity, so reducing the productivity uh, of animals, their ability to, uh, uh, to reproduce effectively. And those two processes can actually cause pathogens to regulate populations of hosts, which is a very interesting ecological phenomenon. Now, one other disease that, uh, that does have a very dramatic effect or has had a very dramatic effect historically in the UK is myxomatosis. I'm sure you've all seen a rabbit uh, infected with the myxoma virus. Well, this is spread by fleas in the UK, it's spread by mosquitoes in other countries. Um, it was introduced in 1953 uh, from France and it promptly killed over 99% of the standing population of rabbits, which was 100 million at the time. Since 1970, genetic resistance has been found in the population and so rabbits appear to be recovering, they've bounced back a little. The current population probably around about 40 million animals, but in, its, uh, in the absence of the virus, the population density would increase two or three fold. And so we'd get back to those 1950s levels quite easily. So let's talk a little bit about disease ecology. So this is really the study of diseases in the context of the ecosystems uh, where they're found. So it's clear that hosts will uh, interact with their parasites and both species will also interact with the environment. And so this can make for very interesting uh, dynamics. And a great example of that is provided by uh, the emergence of hantavirus in the USA. So in the Midwest of the USA, we can see that uh, there is a reservoir of hantavirus in deer mice. And when there is a lot of rainfall, there is rapid vegetation growth. And what happens is that the deer mice respond by increasing their abundance quite dramatically. And they subsequently out, outgrow their resources and enter human dwellings. And that's when infection occurs uh, in humans. The infection spills over from the mice and starts affecting people. And that's a problem because uh, hunter virus can cause uh, a severe pulmonary infection in human beings. So going back to our, uh, our, our, uh, our diagram of disease ecology, we can see hosts and parasites interacting with their environment. But what we're actually talking about for the most part is human modified environments. And in particular, what we're looking at is uh, the edges between human modified environments and uh, natural ecosystems. Now there are several causes of uh, drivers of disease emergence that are related to human activities. 
and disease emergence appears to be rapidly increasing uh, in its rate over recent years. So one of the main drivers of disease emergence from wildlife is habitat destruction. So deforestation, the changes, uh, changes to land use uh, for agriculture, for urbanization, and so on. We've also got uh, intensification of livestock production systems, so increasing numbers of livestock, higher stocking densities, uh, uh, all in pursuit of cheap uh, meat products for a growing population. And then we have uh, direct exploitation of wildlife. So this might be uh, trade in live wildlife. It might be uh, uh, the trade in animals at what's so-called wet markets. So this is where wild animals are kept live and then butchered on the premises and sold uh, as meat. And, uh, and also the farming of wildlife, either for food or for fur production. And then we've got the impact of pollution. So toxic uh, substances that can accumulate in the environment can, uh, can start to be uh, um, uh, biomagnified along food chains. And then we can see them having physiological stressing effects on individual animals, affecting their ability to resist diseases. And the same is true of climate change. By altering uh, uh, the climate, this can put extra physiological stresses on animals, making them less resistant to disease. But climate change also has another added dimension, which is that it can change the distribution of vectors of disease. So as temperatures change, so the distribution of mosquitoes and ticks and biting flies can change in response. And one very good example is that for many years, we didn't have uh, a viral infection of sheep in this country called blue tongue, uh, but that appeared in the 1990s and seems to be as a result of rising temperatures allowing mosquitoes that would usually, usually inhabit warmer climates in Europe to expand their range into the UK, uh, carrying with them the pathogen and infecting sheep. So let's talk uh, a little bit more about exactly how habitat destruction uh, relates to disease emergence. So the main process that happens during habitat, habitat destruction is that it creates edges, edges between natural ecosystems and human modified land. So you can see here a picture of, of the forest around this ribbon development, uh, around this road, and you can see that the forest is very closely integrated around the houses and around the agricultural systems uh, that are adjacent to the road. And what this does is it changes the balance of species abundance in those areas. So some wildlife species will be able to tolerate that level of disturbance, will be able to adapt to this human modified environment, whereas others won't. And it appears that some of the species that are very good at adapting to those environments also happen to be the ones that are likely to carry zoonotic diseases. So for example, many rodents, some bats, some primates, some carnivores and so on. What it also does is it changes the contact patterns between humans, livestock and wildlife populations that live in the adjacent ecosystems. So a very good example of that uh, is the Ebola outbreaks in West Africa that I spoke about earlier. So these have been associated with localized deforestation. The deforestation increases human access to the forest and increases hunting pressure in the local area. So there's more bushmeat consumption. And so there's more opportunity for the exposure of humans to diseases carried by wildlife, including Ebola virus. Another good example, this time uh, uh, including domestic animals, uh, is the intensification of pig farming in Malaysia. So, so this process of, of increased pig farming seems to have resulted in, far, in, in many, pig, uh, many pig herds being kept in mango plantations or around mango plantations. And that means that the pigs are coming in closer contact with the bats that feed on the mangoes. So the bats will be hanging on the trees, feeding on mangoes, chewing a mango, the mango falls on the ground, the pig eats it. Now, this results in transmission of Nipah virus, which circulates normally just amongst the bats to the pigs and then on to the human handlers of the pigs. 
And so we've had outbreaks of Nipper disease, which can be very serious uh, in humans in Malaysia. But I wouldn't like you to think that that uh, these changes in land use and the related emergence of diseases is just a phenomenon that occurs in tropical countries or in the developing world, uh, because it's not. These are global phenomena. And so, for example, the emergence of uh, Lyme disease cases in people in North America as a result of tick bites has been related to uh, the fragmentation of habitats uh, that are inhabited by species that carry the ticks certain deer species, for example, and small mammals. And what this means is that you get more ticks in areas that people have more recreational exposure to. And so you get an increase in the number of people who are bitten by ticks and the number of people who are infected with the disease. Another example comes from Australia, the Australian suburbs, in fact. Uh, the Hendra virus circulates naturally in Australian bat populations. Um, but it can spread to uh, horses and onwards to people. And this has happened in suburban environments and peri urban environments where horses are. And so, uh, so Hendra virus has led to some, uh, some human fatalities uh, in Australia as a result. And in fact, the name of the virus, Hendra, comes from the suburb in Brisbane where it was first detected in humans. And then we can go back and look at bovine tuberculosis again. This is another good example uh, of a disease that responds to land use changes. And so in the USA, in Michigan, cattle ranching often uh, involves cutting out an area uh, of forest, of native forest, uh, and farming uh, herds of, of cattle in a quite an intensive uh, environment. And so you really couldn't invent a better system for the circulation of disease between the cattle and the white-tailed deer that inhabit all of the surrounding forest. And this has had uh, quite serious consequences uh, in terms of livestock welfare, because of course animals that test positive for bovine TB have to be destroyed, there have been economic losses, farmers need to be compensated, the taxpayer foots the bill for that, uh, and then there's stakeholder uh, conflict. So the hunters in the area, they want more white-tailed deer, and of course the farmers want less white-tailed deer. And it creates problems for conservation as well, because the disease is very efficiently circulating amongst these two species, and it can spill over into other species that may be of more conservation concern. And then this role of land use also uh, uh, plays out uh, in the UK environment, where we've got pastoral landscapes uh, where we have a lot of cattle grazing which are absolutely perfect for, for badgers. So effectively where we're farming cattle we're also farming badgers and that creates an environment where bovine tuberculosis can circulate between the two and can persist in certain areas. So I hope that, that, that's made it clear that these changes in land use can impact on disease emergence uh, and disease spread uh, virtually anywhere. So if we have a, a look at the future challenges uh, in the UK um, relating to wildlife diseases, what might, that, what might they be? So I think the first thing to recognise is that, uh, as we all know, many UK species are in uh, sharp decline. Their populations are becoming increasingly fragmented and isolated and reduced in size. And this makes them very vulnerable to uh, random events like disease outbreaks. And not just because the size of the population, uh, size of the populations is so small, but also because there's very little genetic variability in those isolated, fragmented, small populations. Uh, and that means that they have uh, less ability to respond to diseases, to adapt to them, to develop resistance. There are many different drivers of large scale land use change in the UK urbanization, urban growth the effect of global markets on agricultural systems, for example. And of course, that's all been thrown in the mix by Brexit. So we expect that to have some significant changes uh, in agricultural production in this country, and also in the way that uh, uh, land is managed for environmental goods, for example. All of these things 
that change land use will change uh, the disease risk profiles. And then there are biodiversity initiatives. So there's been an awful lot of popular enthusiasm for habitat restoration and especially rewilding uh, in the UK and involving reintroductions of animals sometimes. And all of these things, you know, carry with them some potential for disease risk if they're not managed properly. So given the relationship between biodiversity loss and the emergence of diseases from wildlife, I would pose the question that as ecological professionals, are we neglecting wildlife diseases a little bit? Are we neglecting their importance? For most ecological consultants, uh, uh, they would come into contact with the, the subject of wildlife diseases really largely only in the context of, of biosecurity. And of course, that's important. It's a first line of defense, as I mentioned, uh, for preventing the spread of many diseases that are important for the conservation of wildlife. Um, and there's a, there's a great deal of great information out there, great guidance on how to uh, take precautionary measures to avoid spreading disease. But are we always, as a, a consultancy profession, are we always sufficiently compliant with all of these? Are we always integrating them fully enough into everything we do. I think we need to be aware of that as a potential issue. Also, in the era of the COVID-19 pandemic, maybe we need to realise that quite often we could be the disease risk for wildlife. So the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 is known to be transmissible to uh, some wild animals. Uh, there have been cases in, in domestic dogs and cats, in zoo animals, and very notably in farmed mink, all of which have been due to transmission from people. And so there are real risks that humans could seed infection uh, in wildlife populations. And there are some very, very good guidelines out there provided by IUCN and the OIE. Uh, and we should all be working to these this guidance whenever we're working on, on free living wild mammals. But in a broader context, given the clear links between biodiversity loss, disease emergence and spread, are we really aware of the potential role of wildlife diseases when we're talking, for example, about large scale developments, about the uh, planning and design of mitigation of ecological impacts at large scales? Are the risks of wildlife diseases always considered? In conservation projects? Do they sometimes, do, does this consideration sometimes just slip through the net? I would say that that sometimes happens. And also, as far as land use policy is concerned, when we're consulted as individuals, as professionals, um, or uh, the institutes that represent our profession, when they're uh, um, approached for a consultation about land use policy change, does the issue of wildlife diseases come up very often? I would suggest that possibly not often enough. So what can we do about all of that? Well, I think the, th the first thing that we can do is to understand the problem, is to raise awareness uh, across the industry about the importance of wildlife diseases, about their links to biodiversity and to biodiversity loss. Um, we need to engage with researchers who are active in this area, and there is a lot of research going on looking at wildlife disease emergence and the processes involved. So that, so that might involve us uh, as consultants getting involved with surveillance programs. We have access to uh, animals and their habitats uh, on, on a very unprecedented scale really and could be helping to provide samples for surveillance work. But one thing that we do need to be acutely aware of if we do get involved in surveillance programs is what you do with a positive result. So if you carry out surveillance and you get a positive result for some or other pathogen in the wildlife that you're uh, testing, then you need to know what the implications are for any project that you're running. So that's very important to consider before uh, jumping on board any surveillance programs. But we need evidence from surveillance programs and from, from this further research in order to develop strategies so that we can help manage risks for wildlife diseases. Again, going back to good, good biosecurity practice, we just need to make sure that it's fully integrated across the board, across all of the activities that we carry out in the environment, 
that might carry any risk of spreading diseases. And we need to consider whether disease risk assessments need to be carried out. Certainly when translocations or reintroductions of wildlife are concerned, they're essential. Uh, but maybe we also need to consider whether a disease risk assessment approach might be a useful idea in the context of large scale developments and large scale habitat creation. And then maybe we need to start to consider disease resilience just like we consider climate resilience. So when we're talking about large scale conservation projects, we often talk about making sure that we uh, create environments that are resilient to climate change. And maybe we need to take a similar perspective with wildlife diseases. So just a few uh, concluding remarks. Um, I hope that if I've left you with one key message, uh, it's that the drivers of biodiversity loss are also driving disease emergence. And these diseases, some of these diseases that are emerging are direct, uh, are having a direct impact on human health. But of course, the flip side to that is the protection and restoration of biodiversity might be a tool for the management of diseases that are important for humans uh, and animals, domestic and wild. And so in a way, you could consider that the ability of intact ecosystems to constrain the emergence and spread of disease is perhaps a somewhat neglected ecosystem service. Perhaps that's something that we need to consider when we're talking about the benefits of biodiversity conservation. And then finally, I'd just like to say that I think that the ecology profession can be pivotal in uh, raising awareness of the links between biodiversity loss and human and animal health, and increasing the realization that this is an ecological problem. And perhaps now in the midst of a global pandemic, this might be a good time to start that conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Des. And uh, yeah, it, the thing that strikes me straight away is that the, the amount of thousands and thousands of hours and hundreds of PhDs that have gone into into what you've just presented. <laughs> There's a, a lot of research in that. Um, but also, I suppose, <clears throat> wondering how that impacts on on the way we deal with things in the future, and obviously in, in light of the of the COVID um, pandemic. Um, I've got a couple of questions, so I will start with those. Um, please, anybody else, um, start adding your questions through through the dashboard, and, and we'll we'll get through as many as we can. Um, one of the questions here was uh, a comment as well as a question, but fascinating, though somewhat depressing. So that's uh, <laughs> it, yeah, I suppose. Um, what can we help to do to reduce these diseases, and how many of these are related to global warming? Well, I mean, it's difficult to tease out exactly uh, uh, what the drivers of specific disease events are. And in different circumstances, uh, uh, the same disease can have different drivers. Um, what we know is that, uh, is that climate change is, is certainly stressing wildlife populations, uh, putting physiological stresses on individual animals uh, and causing populations to shrink or, to, or even changes in the distribution of populations. And all of those things can have an impact on the likelihood of disease emergence and, and spread and, and the resilience or lack of it of wildlife populations. I think, the, uh, I think the changes in the abundance and the distribution of vectors is really important in terms of climate change. Many of the, uh, the diseases of tropical environments that are spread by mosquitoes and ticks and so on are being seen to be starting to increase their distribution northwards. Uh, and I, I mentioned the example of blue tongue, but there will be others coming along. And uh, surveillance of the of changes in the distribution of arthropod vectors is actually a, a much uh, understudied uh, area of research that we should do more about. Um, as far as it being a depressing um, uh, topic. I, I, yeah, I, t I take that uh, on board. I mean, biodiversity loss is a depressing subject. Um, this is intrinsically linked to biodiversity loss. But one little spark of optimism uh, that I get from this uh, and from actually the current situation is that um, 
trying to advocate for the protection of ecosystems and so on is is pretty difficult especially when you're talking about protecting wild animals and wild habitats but if you can throw in the added dimension of protecting human health then that starts to make i think a more powerful argument uh, for conservation of biodiversity yeah it, I suppose the other thing I'd noticed, it must be hard for people like yourself or other epidemiologists to have not spent the last year or so saying, we told you so, um, in that it was sort of predicted with the SARS one and, and so on. Um, linked to that, I suppose, is it, it's some a question here from Giuliano, which said, uh, shouldn't the assessment of wildlife diseases be part of the planning uh, legislation process? Well, perhaps... Um perhaps some recognition that, uh, that at least large-scale developments could have some kind of impact uh, on the dynamics of disease, transmission especially between wild animals and domestic animals and so on. Perhaps that should be on the radar of, uh, of planners uh, and so on. So yeah, I would, I would say that maybe there is a, you know, that is an additional box that might need ticking for large-scale developments in particular. To be fair, this is a good question for me, actually, but linked to that, I suppose, perhaps not with planning, but with the emergence of uh, rewilding, biodiversity net gain, reintroduction of, yeah. of animals. Is there a uh, government policy on disease screening? I mean, if we're introducing animals from the continent, even if they are, you know, species that have gone extinct here and therefore they should be here ecologically, do we currently screen for diseases that we might be introducing with them? Well, there has been some screening uh, that has taken place in relation to reintroductions. Um, some of it has taken place, uh, has been carried out by the NGOs who've been involved in the in the reintroductions themselves. Um, some of it has taken place as a rear guard action um, by by the department. Actually, I mean, you may remember that the beavers on the River Otter were re captured by APHA to test them for various diseases um, because whoever had released them, um, well we don't know who released them and we uh, we certainly don't think that any disease risk assessment had been carried out at that point. So yeah, I mean it become, it needs to become an integrated part of any reintroduction program uh, and the best way to do that as you suggest um, is to have some kind of legal framework that recognises that. So, so perhaps there is room for some policy development uh, in this area. Okay, uh, another one here, this, um, zoonotics are natural. Um, are things genuinely worse now than they would be or would we expect them to be? I guess the, the, the point being here is that what you've described there is, is a natu natural system and uh, is, are we yeah, in a situation that's worse than we'd expect naturally? So, so you're right, um, infections that can cause uh, or, or pathogens that can cause disease in humans circulate naturally in wild populations, you know, always have done. Um, uh, but what we have noticed um, through surveillance is that the number, the, the rate at which these diseases are emerging in human populations seems to be increasing. And there is increasing evidence that, the, that these events are correlated with things like deforestation uh, and so on. I mean, there is a huge amount of literature now um, that, that points to this as being a real phenomenon that's gathered in place uh, over previous years. It's always difficult to tell, you know, whether that's partly a result of more surveillance um, being carried out. But I would suggest that, um, that global pandemics are more likely and become and likely to become even more likely in the future as a result of human transport around the globe and the transport of, of, uh, of materials around the globe. Um, and uh, I mean, we've seen we've seen an emergence of gradually increasing uh, a pandemic with gradually increasing global stretch uh, over the past years. You know, we we've had a, 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 the the AIDS epi uh, epidemic, and then we had the SARS that's that epidemic in, in uh, the early 2000s that stuttered uh, around a few countries, got up to about nine countries or whatever, and now we've had COVID, you know, which is a global pandemic, truly global, and it will take some getting rid of if ever we're able to 
to get rid of it at all. So I would say that, uh, that, 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 is, that is an indication that things are, are, are pretty bad and have got worse, in fact. Okay, I have a question here from Ian. It says, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, re-establishing more woodland pasture in the UK uh, as a means of improving biodiversity. Are there potential disease related issues here? Well, I think you have to take each situation um, uh, individually and, and assess what the risks might be. You know, they might relate to what what uh, wildlife species are abundant in the area already, um, uh, the density of, of livestock um, uh, uh, st stocking, uh, and so on. So, I mean, yes, there are potential risks, um, but there may be potential biodiversity gains to be had. These two things need to be traded off against one another. And so we just have to consider the potential for uh, changes in the dynamics of wildlife diseases uh, with, uh, uh, um, in the light of the circumstances, the individual circumstances of each large scale development or each large scale mitigation project or habitat creation project. I'm not saying that you know, there will always be a risk, but you need to assess whether there's a risk. Okay, uh, I think we've probably got time for a couple more. Um, this is quite an open question, but uh, related to what we were saying earlier, but which animals can be infected with COVID? Well, quite a wide range, it, it would appear. Um, so uh, experimental uh, work has shown that uh, uh, quite a lot of carnivores can, can be in, infected, um, primates obviously as well. And more importantly, we've seen natural transmission occurring uh, between people and uh, captive animals. So in zoos, for example, we've had infection in big cats, in primates, in short-clawed otters, uh, in mink farms, we've seen mink infected. We've seen infection from mink farms then being spread into wild mink uh, and into feral uh, escaped mink. So, um, so there's quite a wide range of of species that uh, uh, that could become infected. I think probably the most important are some groups of rodents, mustelids, felids, canids, and primates. Those are probably the most important species. But uh, I should uh, emphasize that as yet, you know, as far as the COVID pandemic is concerned, all of the all of the important transmission is amongst humans. Humans are the reservoir, humans are driving the pandemic. Um, wildlife are really uh, uh, not involved at all. Uh, just the occasional spillover case has been detected so far. So we don't have to panic just yet, is what you're saying? We don't have to panic about wildlife uh, no. getting infected just yet, but, it, but it's wise to be aware of the uh, potential for that to happen. And of course, the problem with that would be you'd then have you'd then be clearing up infection in the human population through vaccination and through yep. uh, various other means. Uh, but you'd be you'd have the virus circulating in wildlife, mutating as it does, perhaps into a strain that could evade the uh, the vaccine, for instance, and then uh, the potential for that to spill back into humans. Okay, I just do have a final question to finish off, and I suppose bring this back towards the world of consultancy. Um, what's the single most important thing that an ecological consultant can do to help prevent disease? Um, in wildlife? Well, I, I think I think that has to be uh, biosecurity protocols, <clears throat> really. Um, raising our awareness of the fact that uh, that we need to integrate bio, biosecurity protocols throughout everything that we do. So, so just casting a critical eye over all of the ecological activities that we that we carry out in the field and uh, just thinking about whether there are routes for potential disease transmission in either direction, from humans to, to, to wild animals or, or, or amongst wild animals, whether we're facilitating the spread of a disease amongst wild animals or, or even infection from wild animals to humans. I mean, you know, we can all be bitten by a, by a tick, for example. So I think just raising awareness and tightening up on biosecurity is probably the most important thing that the industry can do as a first step. And I think by increasing our awareness in that regard, then that will broaden our perspective on the importance of wildlife diseases, you know, at a, at a more sort of strategic level. Okay, 
Great. I, I think we'll be sort of run out of time, so I think we'll leave it there. But um, yeah, thanks once again, Des, for a fascinating talk. Um, last thing I need to say then is to just remind everybody that uh, next month's First Thursday Club is on the 5th of August, and um, our director, John Davis, will be talking about um, public inquiries. And the title of that is Hearing Test, How to Be a Good Ecological Witness at Public Inquiry. And hopefully we'll see you all there. Thanks very much.